These two bodies have traveled almost a million miles in two weeks. This is not science fiction. These are real images of fragments of a giant comet that crashed into Jupiter last year. These bright flashes represent six million megaton explosions, creating plumes as big as Australia. On Earth, we witnessed these catastrophic events, safe in the knowledge it couldn't happen here. Or could it? This town has a strange history. It has twice encountered extraterrestrials. I just thought, I don't want the neighbors to hear about this. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very, very strong force that penetrated the house. We heard this tremendous crash, and we looked up and saw this huge hole. We could see the stars, and... And uh, we just looked at each other and asked a very intelligent question. I asked Juan and she asked me, what happened? <laughs> it uh, came through the ceiling of the living room. It bounced from there into the dining room, which was adjacent, hit the ceiling, rolled and hit the ceiling a second time, then ricocheted off to uh, the east wall of the dining room. And then rolled underneath the dining room table where it was found by a young fireman, one of our volunteer firemen who came to the house after our call. Matter of fact, we celebrate each year. We get, get together for a dinner each year. There are six on of the us anniversary. on the anniversary. So it, it, it's been an important event in our life. A unique experience for the Donahues, but not for Weathersfield. Ten years before, another rock fell out of the sky on this house, only a kilometer away. No other town can boast this. At cocktail parties, we have something to talk about. Nobody can top it. <laughs> <laughs> So rare are meteorite falls that enthusiasts can be driven to the ends of the earth to find them. It's a very tedious job indeed and when the weather is very hot uh, it can almost drive you mad. You uh, have to concentrate very hard, you clear your mind of everything you look on the ground for hour after hour after hour and focus your mind on small, dark rocks. Fingers crossed. We're going to find a big one as well. <laughs> the main thing, not to go wandering off without letting anyone know. Uh, always have a water bottle with you, but mostly never go wandering off on your own. In most parts of the world, your chances of finding a meteorite would be pretty slim. But here on the Nullarbor, they're very high. Here, it's been dry for tens of thousands of years at least, probably much longer than that. It also has a general lack of vegetation, and the local country rock here is made of limestone, a pale rock. Most meteorites are very dark rocks, and so show up against a pale background. They're more easily recognized here than in most other places. Meteorites have been accumulating here for a long time, tens of thousands of years, and so that they are concentrated on this uh, ancient surface that we're walking along. All the rocks on Earth have been processed and altered by volcanic activity, but meteorites are different. Meteorites are a, a unique source of information about the earliest history of the solar system. Some of them are have chemistries which are very similar to the chemistry of the Sun. And clearly these are very primitive objects indeed. Among those who study rocks from space, some now believe they have a much more sinister relevance to life on Earth today. I hate the thought of us behaving like ostriches and stuffing our heads in the ground, pretending that there are no potential dangers around the corner. Um, the reality is that these fireball increases will happen fairly suddenly when they happen. We have no means at the moment of predicting them. They may happen tomorrow, they may happen a hundred years hence, who knows. 
The fact is, um, we do not, as a society, as a world society, have the means of handling this situation at the moment. These grim warnings seem strange, given the benign appearance of fireballs. This one was spotted last year, all the way from Canada to Texas. More of a natural firework, with a bit of a bang at the end. Michelle Knapp's car is like a museum exhibit. Hundreds of people have been coming by since Friday to look at the hole in her trunk. What damaged her car was this rock. Already, she says, she has had several calls from museums and collectors wanting to buy it and the trunk of her car. Unfortunate for Michelle, but hardly something that should panic society. Rather a thrill for the collectors and a spot on local television. Mr. Drucock, what were you doing at the time? I went out the back, back of our, our house, and uh, <coughs> I heard the bang. Oh, they were so excited to think that it was a meteorite. And we hope that members of the public will help us by looking for these. I'm inclined to wish now that it dropped on somebody else's garden, not mine. Would it actually have been anything else, like an unidentified flying object or a spacecraft? <laughs> that is an unanswerable question. Above all, society is sceptical nowadays. Ideas of death and catastrophe from the sky belong to ancient times, before the age of science, when superstition made people petrified of the heavens. They clearly saw the sky as interactive with the Earth, and originally, um, the broad idea was that there were things impacting upon the Earth. Um, God hurled his thunderbolts at us, and there were um, catastrophes. Catastrophism ruled. The heavens were seen as a source of wonder and potential global disaster. Then came the Age of Enlightenment, and all this was to change. First, Isaac Newton explained, through his theories of gravity, the motion of the planets. And then his friend, Edmund Halley, correctly predicted the return of a comet, which was subsequently named after him. The picture that emerged was clearly the one that Newton himself was picturing, where the solar system was seen as a giant clockwork machine and um, the image was that this clockwork would function forever and forever. The new philosophy of science took a uniformitarian approach. It argued the Earth was billions of years old and reasoned its formation must have been unimaginably slow. And this idea hadn't been truly accepted by um, perhaps the church and clerics, many of whom still thought that the biblical record implied catastrophe. The whole of this argument came to a head in the uh, middle of the 19th century with an argument between um, Bishop Wilberforce and um, Huxley, which Huxley won. And this was essentially a victory for science over everything. And it was science with catastrophism written out of it. Turning our backs on our superstitious past, catastrophes were laughed out of mainstream science and banished to the realms of science fiction. By the time this film was made in 1910, to celebrate the return of Halley's Comet, only religious mystics thought the sky held any surprises. A long time ago, it was a flood in Noah's day that wiped out mankind. Now it will be um, a gigantic fireball. And I have already seen a preview of this event. And it certainly will annihilate many, many nations. The world will not end. Certainly these new bodies will pass our planet, but we are still here. 
Predicting the end of the world is an annual crackpot event in our society, an attempt to corner the newspaper headlines. Massive impacts and catastrophe are in the textbooks, but very much as part of the Earth's early history. Over four billion years ago, when the solar system was still forming, there were swarms of large rocks smashing into the Earth. But after a billion years of bombardment, these giant asteroids disappeared, leaving the Earth alone, inviolate in space. The meteorites we see nowadays are a pale shadow of those earlier giants. Still, they prove that the space between planets isn't entirely empty. There's a constant infall of uh, extraterrestrial material. The bulk of this arrives as dust. Hundreds of thousands of tons of, of material actually falls each year. If that was all to arrive in one go, clearly that would be catastrophic. But it for, this dust falls gently or drifts gently down onto the surface of the Earth. Only very occasionally, larger objects, sufficiently large to survive passage through the Earth's atmosphere, land on the surface of the Earth as meteorites. A gentle rain of dust and pebbles that our atmosphere, like a shield, protects us against. It was a nice, safe picture that is only now being seriously challenged. The scientific doubt started in the 1950s, when the truth about a large hole in Arizona became too big to ignore. Well, this crater was the first meteorite crater in the world that was shown to be a meteorite crater. So it was extremely important in that first intellectual step to recognize that, yes, indeed, very large objects do fall out of the sky and make holes in the ground. To help his colleagues with this intellectual step, Shoemaker needed solid scientific evidence. One was to study the structure, the deformation on the walls of the crater, and how rocks have been pushed out and then peeled up and overturned and I could compare that deformation directly with experimental craters, smaller craters formed by nuclear explosions. But this crater was geologically very young. Could there actually be larger rocks out there amongst the pebbles and dust? From then on, the Arizona crater became famous as a tourist attraction. To science, it was just a one-off. Shoemaker turned his attention to somewhere where he could study more craters. Maybe it looks obvious now that the craters on the moon were formed by impact, but in fact, the vast majority of scientists who studied the moon, astronomers in particular, at the time that uh, I began this work, thought that these craters on the moon were probably formed by volcanoes. That had been the prevailing idea for a century before. The Apollo missions confirmed the violent history of the moon's surface. It also provided Shoemaker with information that lay hidden on Earth. The beauty of going to the moon is there's no rain, no atmosphere to speak of. And so a crater once formed lasts a very, very long time. Uh, so we have a perfect record going back three and a third billion years in which we can say here is the rate at which these things have been formed and compare that directly to the Earth. He found that large craters were still regularly being formed, and so somewhere out there, giant rocks were still threatening Earth. This is a problem uh, that perhaps is of more interest to a geologist than to an astronomer. Uh, indeed, the astronomers in the 20th century essentially abandoned the solar system. Their attention was turned to the stars and the galaxies, and very few were interested in the solar system and the planets or specifically in the Earth. The Earth and the Moon really ceased to be an object of inquiry for astronomers. 